Gravy, not just another Sheffield Wednesday podcast. I'm one of the hosts, Richard Miller, and my co-host, who prevented from serving customers at his usual shop front, is now serving out dollops of gay repartee door-to-door throughout the Calgary metropolitan region, Dr. Luke Bledall. How are you doing today, Luke? I'm good. Um, very good. Thank you, Rich. Thank you for the intro. Um, I, sometimes I like to also do a bit of an intro for Rich, um, so I've also got one for you as well. So, <clears throat> from the top. Welcome to Different Gravy, not just another Sheffield Wednesday podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Luke Gledel, and joining me as ever is my co-host, a man who in the midst of the pandemic has ordered so much food that you thought it was catered. It's not the remix to Ignition, but he is popping fresh out of the kitchen with another fresh, freshly baked banana bread. It's my esteemed co-host, R. Miller, a.k.a. Richard Gravy. It's Mr. Richard Miller. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's lovely. I and have actually... also, Rich, oh, okay. I also, so that's a little gift for you, Rich. Um, I want to kind of thank you. I listened back, unfortunately, to the episode where Rich came with his best goals and I wasn't a very good co-host, so I, I felt bad about that. Anyway, um, as a way of kind of saying thank you to Rich for all the great work he does on producing the podcast and being an excellent friend and co-host and just excellent person, I have a little gift for you, Rich. So if you just check your WhatsApp now, Rich, I've just sent you a link. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> should, I, should I play it? <laughs> you should, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, I can just play it from the site. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Rich. Hi. It's me. Yeah, I know. I know what you're thinking. It can't be. It can't be Rebecca Lucy Taylor, a.k.a. Self-Esteem. She's so beautiful and well turned out she would never have this many spots or haven't showered this long but no it's true it's me and i've i'm coming to you in this way because i think it gives an added layer of intimacy that you deserve (laughs) and you deserve that because you are a legend and i heard this from luke but i could also tell because only a true legend produces and edits a sheffield wednesday podcast UTO, the greatest, the greatest team, the greatest team ever, right? Because it's not about winning. (laughs) Uh, It's never been about winning to me. It's been about being a hooky owl. Um, I hope you're all right in a bloody lockdown, in a global pandemic. But just got this feeling that you are, because... Like I said, if you're a, if you're an owl, you can cope with anything because you're used to searing long periods of disappointment. <laughs> um, loads of love to you. Uh, you must be a legend for your mate to do to um to ask for a cameo from an idiot like me. <laughs> Hope to see you at a gig or something soon, just in a room full of people. A stadium, ideally, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Loads of love. Keep safe. Well, that is tremendous. Thank you so much, Luke. You're very welcome, Rich. (laughs) Ah, I'm welling up. Uh, she's an absolute treat of a of a person. What a what a what a. She's in, she's very very incredible on many levels. So lots <laughs> of thanks to uh, Rebecca Lucy Taylor, half a slow club, and a hundred percent of self esteem. Uh, Rich and I are both huge fans of self esteem. I I absolutely loved uh, her last album or her debut album of self esteem last year. It was my album of the year. So seeing that she's now on cameo for an impeccably reasonable rate meant that uh, it was a real absolute no brainer to uh, have a shout out to uh, to Rich through there. So thank you very much to to Rebecca and uh, I guess our first technically podcast guest and yeah. someone who I would love to have at some point as a guest on the podcast as she is also a big she is also a big Wednesday as well. So yeah um check out check out compliments please her debut album and also her new ep cuddles please is coming out on may 1st as well with alternate versions from that album and uh yeah 
just uh, support her because she's fantastic. Absolutely, and very much our, our sort of dream guest. For, I would say, absolutely for the for the podcast. Um, well, I'm I'm overwhelmed, but I do feel we should keep you know propelling the show along. So, without further ado, I'm going to uh, breaking hoo hoos. Bring us into a, a world of tremendous breaking news. This is one of the things you know the club were very quick to get it out on uh, social media. It's a it's a you know it's a big thing for all i think for all wednesday nights we've all been waiting to hear and um it's the rumors are true luke moses adabajo has joined instagram so (laughs) (laughs) i I know it's impossible to think of words in this situation but uh, have you got any for us um staggered (laughs) he's going to be serving up delicious content to uh, to the world at large under um his username which is uh, he's at moses underscore 28 underscore so what content do you think we'll think we'll get some first traps from uh, from moses do you think there'll oh, be some I... dank memes that he drops on us <laughs> what uh, what else I think it, you're probably going to come for the dank memes, and then you're going to stay for the the thirst traps. I think that's the way he's going to probably work it. You know, he's a very and... he's a very quick player. So how fast can he run across uh, one of the rooms in his abode or his backyard? I'd like to see that. That would be some good content. I think. Could, could, uh, also, something we haven't seen from him, you know, show, showing a, a breadth of skills. Could he run upstairs? That's a good point. We've only seen him on a flat level, really, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> We're really um, getting some elements. How good is he at? Fr- we know how good he is at two D chess. How good is he at three D chess? Oh, well, exactly. And we've seen him on grass. How does he play on the, the astroturf in his back garden? <laughs> how is he on patio? How is he on carpet, shag rug, or wooden flooring? <laughs> oh dear. So, um, <laughs> slightly, slightly uh, bigger news really was the fact that this there's this sort of leak from. Uh, the EFL that was published in the Telegraph by John Percy, who has a bit of a history of, of having a, an inside line into the work of uh, the esteemed English Football League uh, management, um, and supposedly our date with the the arbitration panel is is set uh, for July. That's what we've heard. Mm. Now, if we were in the midst of a normal season, the fact that we we hadn't had a a ruling made yet would mean that whatever, if we do face a penalty, whatever penalty we face would happen next season. But obviously, this is not by any means a a normal time to be doing anything in, particularly the world of football has been completely sort of thrown thrown up in the air. Whether that still stands and we don't need to worry about this season in particular, I don't know. There is still the plan to try and get through the remaining games of the season, uh, although as time rolls on, we have to see how, how feasible that ends up being. But that, that's really as far as it goes. The EFL haven't commented on that, so it's not an official date. Uh, Wednesday have chosen not to comment either, so it's genuinely one of those stories that is pretty much, the headline is is the story. There's not a lot of content beyond that, but it it's something, I guess, not to look forward to, but it means there's hopefully some sort of end date on the horizon. Is that about as positive as we can take the spin on this, Luke? I don't know. I mean, this is the whole thing. Um, Could you imagine a situation that kind of happened with Birmingham that seemingly it just never ends? Seemingly it's just Uh a, seemingly it's a Lord of the Rings style kind of um, litany of litigation, basically. Are you calling Rick Parry the the Eye of Sauron in this uh, scenario? I guess so, yeah. I guess he's kind of uh, Christopher Lee donning his uh, bad guy clothing, yeah. <laughs> and then sort of the, our final sort of element of news, I believe you have a, a bit of a report for us, Luke. Yes. So right now what's happening is the Stay Into Toto Cup, which is basically uh, basically the kind of FIFA online. And uh, once again, Luke is fervently chomping at the bit to report on some online FIFA. <laughs> That's right. Luke, who hates watching digital football, is getting beside himself at watching the curling of esports FIFA online. So the Stay Into Toto Cup is raising money for NHS staff and a shout out to the donators and the professional footballers representing the club developing callous skin on their fingertips for this great course. Wednesday were drawn into the weirdly apt Group C alongside other fellow Tim Pot luminaries of the game in Sunderland, Fulham and Newport County. 
um, represented by Jordan Willis, Cyrus Christen, and Tristan Abrams for Sunderland, Fulham, and Newport County, respectively. And uh, Jordan O'Brien, the young under-23 academy striker at Wednesday, is representing Wednesday. Uh-huh. Um that's a very Wednesday-esque kind of group C, isn't it? Can yes, we just have a bit is. of commentary? It's because I'm there thinking, you know, that's uh, you're throwing some pretty big rocks the length of uh, the British Isles to find such teams. <laughs> Definitely. You know, it's, it's almost like a DHL kind of uh, flash over the kind of Earth's, uh, you know, hemisphere to get to those places. But it feels very Wednesday-esque, which is kind of strange. Yeah, definitely. It it, it sort of feels homely being in being mm-hmm. in such company. And outside Ford, I had just uh, before we kind of get into uh, looking over the games. How did it decide which one of the basic bros that Wednesday would represent us? Surely there was a fight or a contest, and why couldn't I see this? So I could get disappointed, upset at that, also. <laughs> yeah. They should have had to, you should have had to play in, I think. I think so. I think so. Um, so the game was 85 rated, so we have the lack of reality of seeing Wednesday be as good as Newport County. We can but dream. Um, further suspension of disbelief in that Westwood started and Luango was fit to start. Oh. Um, that first game was up against Newport County. Um, and I'm not going to go through. I've got a lot of comments about the goals here. But basically, we won 6-1 for the first. It was Ooh. an absolute dicking to the point that, um, oh, again, Josh Windass is a lone striker, which seems to be a, a, a FIFA narrative. He seems to be a bit spry and seems to be enjoyed in the uh, in the FIFA role. And uh, Fernando Forestieri was in the hole as well, which Ooh. was kind of strange. He's bringing uh, that swim, swimwear models bod. He does. He does. That's what FIFA's all about. Does indeed. If you've got the bod, you get the nod. That's the FIFA <laughs> motto. <laughs> That's the look. That's the look. The look of bod, you're saying. <laughs> yeah. To make a reference to more Sheffield music through ABC after referencing uh, self-esteem at the front of the podcast. <laughs> Um, Alex Hunt, Conor Grant, and Eurohide came on, but they could not afflict any more misery. So it was just a. Uh, oh no, that was a five-one win. Uh, after the game one, Wednesday were top of the pops uh, into match two. Um, we had the delight of the uh, audio from uh, John O'Brien's stream at uh, the beginning, where I said, "Grant still to come on, little leg end." <laughs> uh, half of all the joy of overhearing a tired phone conversation. Same eleven. <laughs> Um, once again, it was a massive victory for, for Jordan O'Brien as he won wow. 6-1 in this game. And this was up against, this was a game against Fulham. So this was him putting Cyrus Christie to the, to the sword, um, of which one of the goals, uh, so some of my notes, uh, one of the best parts of the game was about 3-1. He said, hang on, I've been practicing. Who is good at free kicks? Uh, then he blazed it over the bar with Bannon. That was quite fun. Oh. Um, he said he's not bringing O on. I guess that was Azazi. When I brought him on last time, he was dodgy. That was his quote. <laughs> okay. Uh, Granty, as he likes to call his mate, Connor Grant, scuffs in square across the goal. Uh, he wishes he could do a front flip, bless him. 5 1. The joy of bringing on your <laughs> mate and scoring with him countered by not being able to play as yourself. Yeah. And then he noted that Granty has a really bad touch on the game. <laughs> Excellent. So the, so the, the 85 setting means that players are kind of all equal or they're just like all they're like do they maintain intrinsic values so like is a quick player still quick just i think that's a mentality yeah okay. it's not and something then, i've uh, ever experienced outside of this um yeah i think it's supposed to be everything's on a kind of semi-par as much as they kind of can be yeah so it's kind of in the head of the person playing whether they have a good touch or a bad touch probably <laughs> i guess it probably is yeah yeah so that leads up to the uh, third match, where he's up against Jordan Willis from Sunderland AFC. So that brings us probably into a nice kind of segue at the end of this into what our episode is about today. Mm. Uh, who was also 100%. So both of them at that point were, you know, okay. going uh, two, two out of two, two and zero. So clash interesting clash of the Titans. Who's going to lose their status? Um, As they the say joy- in five sports, someone's O has got to go. <laughs> And uh, the O was going to go, um, was obviously another one of those was Ozazi, as he uh, proclaimed uh, in the uh, the pre-stream yes. warm-up. He said, dodgy, no chance. <laughs> we had the interesting it. concept of Sunderland, but they were actually playing in a Barcelona kit in the new camp. What? Uh, oh, yes. so he picked a different team? No, he played the Sunderland. They just played oh. in a Barcelona kit. Oh, that's so weird. Head games from the Mac and Clogger. Yeah. 
So it was end-to-end stuff and it was scintillating a, a match you could imagine as a f- fictional computer football match could be between both Wednesday and Sunderland and Barca's kit. Uh, a sheep in wolf's clothing is my note. <laughs> nice. Um, so actually, Sunderland went 2-0 in the lead, um, including the second goal was bagged in the 34th minute by uh, Lionel Maguire. Oh, lovely. So an absolute nightmare it's, it's, it's for... Maguire. An absolutely nightmare for Job. And it led to our protagonist announced half halftime that he needs a big performance. And then he subbed uh, Barry Bannon and Mass Maluongo in centre mid for Conor Grant and Alex Hans. <laughs> But uh, ele- but uh, funny if it actually paid off in the fifth sixth minute he pulled one back uh, fed into Connor Grant he lashed home Job sighs and then says what a finish Grant very good at the two two equalizer he said Hunty and Granty come on shouts off protagonist as he profits off a of bad cost rebounding um, <laughs> for place to lash home and then finally Trumpy Bum had a one on one on the sixty seventh minute and put it away to make it three two oh that was the end of it and the final comment Jordan O'Brien said that's the last time I'm bringing Richie on. <laughs> so that is my coverage of the group stages of the State into Toto Cup. Tremendous. Uh, Tremendous. Leading into the final 32, where we've drawn a two leg against Grimsby Town in true Wednesday fashion. So when's that uh, due to? I'm not sure. It'll probably be sometime soon. I think they've just announced the uh, draw today, so it should be okay. coming up. It'll probably be first game played by the time stuff comes out, I guess. But as you say, apt to be drawn. Uh, alongside Sunderland, because this week, me and Luke both watched the new Netflix documentary, Sunderland Till I Die. Uh, well, the second uh, season of that. Uh, the first one is is well worth a watch as well, if you're you're interested. You know, if we had a klaxon for spoiler alert, this would be a time to do it, because we're going to talk things through. But uh, the, the sort of weird thing with it is... Uh, just as a kind of uh, an overall comment, I didn't, I wasn't paying enough attention to Sunderland's season to know how it had gone. So it was, it was all, it was all quite a sort of unveiling for me. Um, so I, I didn't know exactly how things ended, although I did know they they on they're not okay, in the championship. This is the championship, yes, yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, I knew that the the massive everyone knows the massive spoiler of um, Sunderland are not currently competing with us in the championship. So. Uh, it didn't go exactly to plan, but how, quite how and where it went awry, I wasn't sure of. So it was uh, still an enjoyable ride in that regard. Um, so we sort of thought about breaking it down in different sections, Luke, didn't we? So we're sort of talking about the kind of the board, uh, some of the players that feature, some of the fans that feature, and then a bit of a comment on the show in general. Is that how you sort of broken it down as well? True as well. Yeah, there might just be, um, should we just segue the manager quickly into the players as well? I mean, Jack Ross isn't featured too heavily, but there's a few kind of small comments I've got about, uh, yeah. about Jack Ross. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I sort of slid him in there with the players as well. Sounds good. Um, so the 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 main characters really conversely to last time because i thought last time it was a more varied series last time i think there was much more of the fans there was there really was and there was a lot more about the those people in the fabric of the club so it was interesting seeing that what is it they made a lot of in the first series about those the people who worked at the club especially the the chefs That's you know, it, there yeah. was like uh, there was that lady. I think her name was Joyce, and then the other guy she was with. It were the two. You know, they were very kind of um, vocal and interviewed quite a lot about. It. Yeah, there was a lot more of the characters around the club, and you did get a lot of Martin Bain was the sort of um, in, the sort yes. of director of football. So there was a lot of him. Um, not much from the manager, really. There's a the, although their manager. I think they they changed manager two times that season. It was who was it? Chris Colm. <laughs> Is Chris Coleman the one who was brought in? Or, no, it's Chris Coleman, Stuart Grayson. Yes, that's right. Yeah, Grace is it Stuart Grayson? Simon Grayson. Simon, Simon Grayson. Grayson. Apologies. But but this time, really, by and large, we're focused on the chairman and the kind of marketing board, or you know, another board member anyway, who's in charge mm. of marketing. Um, so that Stuart Donald is the is the chairman, um, and Charlie Methvan is is the name of the uh, Charlie Methvan. Yeah. The marketing guy. Charlie Meth fan, because um, uh, he comes from a great lineage of uh, Breaking Bad fans. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I think he's really the star of the show. And uh, I 
For better or worse. He's a For better or worse. And prior to this, we, Rich and I were kind of back and forth. And I'm like, uh, Rich also did a brilliant <laughs> impersonation <laughs> of uh, Mr. Mr. Meffin. And um, I, I hope, really hope that uh, that's <laughs> not... It might get an outing. Like just, I hope it somehow <laughs> finds a way to come and stop. So I, I, I've kind of really, you know, I've also like, you know, I've uh, largely at first done a lot of my comments. But he's... <laughs> Uh, you know it through a, an episodic mentality okay. um but i think it really just kind of strikes off from that first episode with like just that hilarious boardroom meeting and how he says the piss take party stops now stops yeah, yeah 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 so he's like this sort of a guy you know real um <laughs> you know, absolutely love a bit of football but um you know rugger bugger at heart um you know great you know, guys, yeah, the piss take party stops now, okay, guys? Yeah, yeah. He's really um, so close to, uh, if anybody's uh, heard uh, Bob Mortimer doing his uh, his sort of generic business prick uh, character, um, Barry Homeowner, he, Charlie Methven has, is that man in real life. It's really, he's exactly that sort of person. <laughs> and lots of David Brent style moments where he sort of makes a gag or does something to try and get people excited in a meeting. And then they look at the faces and everybody is just stony faced, just wishing they weren't there and maybe weren't alive to witness what was happening in front of them. <laughs> just, yeah. And that just, it's summed up right from the <laughs> off. I mean, I, I, I thought it was interesting just to kind of look at the show and say, I actually got, I made a lot more. It's really funny at the beginning. Like it's <laughs> really yeah. awfully patron, you know, just Dave. It's, it's very, the office, David, Brown. I'm glad you said that it is a bit David Brown like <laughs> at the beginning. And the more you get on, the more the kind of, that kind of sinks to the background, I would say, and more yes, kind of yeah. focus on the season. But I think obviously the interesting thing is because they're doing a lot to talk about the setup of that season is interesting. And, yeah setting the, the, like, the sort of targets in place and things like that. But right at that beginning, how, you know, he, he, was it, he's just a really condescending. I, I really hate when people get flip charts out. Oh, it's yeah. so condescending. <laughs> so he just has to write like all these things on a, a flip, book, flip chart, which we don't get to see, which I thought was frustrating. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then he tells people we're hundred percent fucked. Which, <laughs> It's just hilarious. But I love how they're doing this. Like everyone, you know, everyone has a sense of like, you can sense the sense of like, you can see and sense this discomfort that all the staff have in that room because <laughs> it's uncomfortable and it makes you squirm seeing people's reaction to that. You know, it's, it's a very good reality TV kind of coverage. Um, but the fact that he has to just be a condescending prick and write it on a flip chart. And he kept, he, there's a bit towards the, uh, towards the end where he was sort of like, he's obviously got this amazing house. I mean, whether he's bought it or renting it or whatever, but you know, he's like, he's having his cafe au lait, um, you know, out in the garden, <laughs> six o'clock in the morning. I mean, I couldn't be doing this in London. Um, and just, he keeps like crapping on the Northeast, but you know, like uh, people were saying, you know, like, you know, Blaise Sunderland, full of poor people and awful, you know, that's, Brexit people, just like he's always putting them down. And he's like, but actually, it's not bad. Um, you know, <laughs> like he does that about six times in the show. <laughs> it's just really uh, the condescension all the way through, not just with. <laughs> With, with the people that he works with, but also the whole city, the whole area oh. is just, um, oh, it's really shocking at times. And I, just as a very small comment yeah. as well, I remember when he said, he's, oh, we go back up north. Yeah. And it reminded me a lot of the, uh, it just it made me think of the classic, yeah, there's a, a fast show sketch with oh, yeah. Paul Whitehouse with him and his, uh, him and his uh, lady friend, like dressed up as um, kind of uh, some kind of middle class <laughs> Kind of country toffs. Yeah. And he goes, Jolly her, we're Geordies, Divin Chinar. <laughs> Divin Chinar? Yes. How are you the lads? Yeah. 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 It's really pumped and, up, uh, yeah. Did you did you think to I want to kind of keep we'll keep peppering this with some Wednesday references as well, okay. you know this is what we're doing. <laughs> did you think that Charlie Meth then did you remind you a bit of Nick Parker? You remember think, Nick yes. Parker? There was some there were definitely some echoes. Did uh, I ever tell you about I went down to watch Wednesday? It was one of the London away trips and I was back on the train at night and Nick Parker was on the train with us. No. And the, like 
it, there was just a bunch of Wednesdayites, or you know, having a few beers and getting a bit larry and like <laughs> you know, uh, singing um, "I Ho Silver Lining." Oh yeah, yeah. It, and it was just, it was so funny to watch, like just <laughs> sensing this guy. I mean, I would be if I was in a situation, I'd be uncomfortable as fuck. Yeah, yeah. In that situation, but it was so awkward, <laughs> oh, and <laughs> just I got so many kind of overtones and memories of that. Just watching his interaction <laughs> with fans. <laughs> So the big bit in that first episode I want to talk about is so he was playing the music he was like <laughs> I want to talk about him picking the music that they're going to come yes. out to so he picked Dance of the Nights and he says what do you think of this to people completely missing any connection to the little known BBC primetime show The Apprentice <laughs> well that's what they come out to yeah. anyway, isn't it <laughs> Did they come out to that beforehand? That's what they came out to beforehand. So he was sort of slagging that off and bringing in his new trance slash classical crossover song. It's just a, it was a trance remix of that, wasn't it? I thought that was a mentality. I think. Well, he. That's what. Maybe that's what the tweak was. Yeah. Right. Oh, jeez. And then, like, you know, you know, he, so I didn't make that connection because actually he played that. It's like, here's what we do, and here's this now. And it sounded like he was, you know, I've put from my notes, he then picks some sub-William Orbit EDM and then gets derailed by a kid who suggests that it's a new PA system. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, there's a sort of, well, it doesn't matter what you play, because yeah, (laughs) fucking shade. And Charlie, um, you know, reacts to that with uh, typical grace. (laughs) He just, like eyeballs him like he gives him a stare of death and doesn't acknowledge his comment at all <laughs> there's one little moment sorry this is it, very tiny thing but it did sort of stay with me um when we were introduced to charlie meth then he's on the phone and they zoom in on his phone and his iphone cover is filthy full of <laughs> <laughs> and like a hair sticking up. I'm not sure whether it's a pube. I think it looked quite straight. So I, I wouldn't want to accuse him of having a pube sticking out of his iPhone case. But it just need like you would not have put it on the table if you knew it was going to end up on telly. <laughs> <laughs> just sort of there's just something sort of a bit con manny about him a kind of traveling salesman kind of thing uh, yeah that's kind of his I, I, vibe i mean it's, it's just the the comedy gold of watching this guy i mean it's similar to like i really enjoyed watching martin bain this yes. kind of um was, Mar- was martin bain previously a model He's got a very kind He's of... He's very... Uh, holds himself, doesn't he, in a certain he does. way? He really does, yeah. But it's just... It's funny watching him fire up his, fire up his ne- Nespresso, you know, <laughs> machine or something like that. Um, it actually takes people... Um, you know, it takes people, like, years and years to learn how to do this. But um, the, the, in pod form, you know, any, anybody can. Anybody can make themselves a, a lovely little espresso. Perk you up in the morning. <laughs> so I just want to make a comment about the... Sorry. Pod. Like it was so great. I thought it was hilarious when he goes out on the pitch and then like he goes into like certain bits of the stadium <laughs> yeah. to like a little walkie talkie, his little thumbs up from the thing. It was so funny. But <laughs> so I, I made my notes, I was like, you know, maybe ask the fans what they think. So yeah. surely what music they come out to means more to the fans. Here's his Luke. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the future had sounds of love. See, they're from Sunderland. Yes, yeah. See, he, I well, can he be also- in a- Football club. Well, it was the fact that this new dance remix of the old song that they had was not only going to do something to the the crowd were going to go wild in a way that they hadn't for twenty years now at Sunderland. That's that was going to be the impact of this song. And then also he went into the tunnel and the away dressing room to hear it. And in the away dressing room, you could barely hear anything of this song. And it was just weird. It was like you're supposed to be making this point of like, yeah, when we really turn it up, you know. Imagine the fear in the uh, in the away dressing room. Imagine it. And it's like he just didn't get any of the moments he was hoping for, I think, from that little wander down the tunnel <laughs> to hear the song. Oh, just... So I guess to kind of jump ahead, the the big kind of um, the the big next kind of big focus for Charlie and Methan, which I think is interesting, is that <clears throat> is that Boxing Day game. Yeah. So they're desperate to beat the 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 record number for a for a, a game in League One, which uh, just feels a bit Tim Pop. 
Well, also part of that, they they were they were in a school handing out tickets. So it's like, how many of yeah. the tickets were oh, yeah. free? So did you? And uh, I, I guess you know one of the other kind of members of staff that we won't really focus on a great deal is the is it the the Northern Irish girl? Yes, who's yeah. on the who's basically just getting dogs abuse from Charlie Methan. Yes. I've also never heard the term Markoms being used, and I hate oh, it so right. much. Oh, yeah, it's off. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you are a Markoms professional, Rich. You've been, <laughs> you've heard this term, like, before <laughs> Before you watched yeah, someone's life. No, it's, it's, a, it's a horror show of a, of a term, really. It's awful. But, yeah, so they had the big push for this record. I, I did make the note about the fact that we saw them in several schools <laughs> and, like, how many of this <laughs> record number of tickets were free, Ooh, which sort what? of takes away from it. Um, I don't, don't, I'm not entirely, well, that was, that was just the weird kind of thing with the narrative, which was maybe more of the show Mm. was, you know, he's just, there's this, this, uh, you know, it's something he really wants. He's, you know, he's, you can see him kind of, um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say he did this, but maybe it's a little bit sometimes like I joke with people like how sometimes people get ideas and I say they're kind of like cocaine ideas. Kind of people, people do like a few lines of cocaine, they get really excited and they just start kind of spitballing these like crazy ideas. And you can tell people That's are right, excited. A musical. Yeah, yeah. People are kind of excited that are in the zone and they kind of get this stuff out. But you're like, they're thinking, you if you're not there, you kind of look from the outset and you're like, you need to, you need to kind of write this down and think about it really <laughs> come back to this another day and see if you still think it's a good idea yeah exactly <laughs> and so you know he's always trying to kind of drum up some revenue which i get which we can i don't know maybe another thing we talk about is the finances because that's it's kind of astonishing when you look at the finances yeah from what's kind of being shared um but you know he's he's saying to the marcoms people do the impossible or lose your job <laughs> yes and, and then, then they, you know, there's there's a brief focus on, you know, they said there have been, you know, a series of redundancies. And th- so know. they did make that that Boxing Day. They did, you know, spoiler alert, they break the record um, yeah. by a couple of thousand. And but the they then show the Northern Irish lady packing her bags and going. So, like, she's asked to do the impossible, does she, it? And still she... gets back. Did she get fired? Yeah, that was the, the end of that episode um, was her sort of out of, the, out of the window looking at her sort of putting her stuff in her the back of the car and, you know, giving her goodbye hugs to folks. Because oh, by, by the end... That's awful. Yeah, well, by the end, the marketing department was just the kiss-ass from the first meeting. The guy that sort of likes the new tune um, is the only guy that seemed to be left on the staff with, Char- with Charlie. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> well, I know, because what's the point of the you know really pushing people and he sort of he sends her to get him a beer that day as well imagine yeah. doing that and then sacking that person what an awful human being i know <laughs> well, the, the thing that so the thing i want to say about the narrative which is <clears throat> i wonder how much sometimes a narrative is the show dictating the narrative and the actual thing itself is dictating the narrative mm. so the funny thing that was interesting was like she's like oh i don't you, she was like i don't think we're going to do this Oh, you know, we're looking probably about like 37, 38,000, 37,000, which is going to be shy of. So the biggest league one ever crowd was Leeds, 38,250. Interestingly enough, I had to go back and I was there thinking, didn't Wednesday be that? But actually, ours was 38,082 against Wickham. I did. So, I did the exact same thing. I, I wasted about half an episode searching through to, um, <laughs> to sort of and while, prove my point. But I bet. All of ours were probably sold. Also, to go back as well, near that beginning of that first episode, he does say, first large club to go properly bust. And I was like, uh... <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of us like you, mate. Don't don't fucking get... Don't get it twisted. So, anyway, there's this mentality that, like, they're not... It's going to be so close. And they're not going to get there. And yeah. then... And then they surpass it comfortably. Yes. Where? What's this kind of leap of? Because again, he's a real, yeah, he's a real prick to that Northern Irish lady at, on he, the match day because he wants and, to announce the numbers, and he's yes, and he's yeah. like doesn't even do it. Doesn't matter. If we're two hundred out. Doesn't matter. Okay. And so and like they're miles over it. They're miles over it, and then which then makes me wonder. And I guess now I think I know. I like I, I was wondering. Like, would they ever capture if he was ever nice to any of these people or yeah, yeah. like apologize to that woman afterwards? 
you've got to think that they have at some level they must have been happy to have the documentary go out well i guess the interesting thing the funny thing was the first one i think they did was the hilarious thing about this is they signed up for this thinking it would be this is us returning to the big time this is our yes you know this is our premiership return ticket to use a really you know dated wednesday reference yeah and it wasn't and it was such a car crash of a season that is but I'm like, they must be getting money to do this, because why would they do it? Well, yeah. I, well, yes. Yes, there's a big part of that. Although I, I did, you know, jumping ahead to our sort of comments on the show overall, I'd love to have something like that about Wednesday. Would you? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, no. I, no, I don't think so. Like, <laughs> just to, not to me. And, well... I'd love to see all the ins and outs of sort of stuff behind the scenes and things like that. I think I don't know. I d- I just I think the first one did a better job of you know making characters of the players, and I think it's something that with the All, all or Nothing series on uh, on Amazon, the best series of that are actually the ones that focus on the players because I think they're the interesting. True. I, I agree. I agree because they're people under the lens who we don't really see. We yeah. don't really see and think much about them as human beings, unfortunately. Their home lives, their you know, sort of the, yeah, uh, you know, backgrounds. I, those sort of things are interesting. I think following a couple of kind of egoish businessmen, if it, at times this really feels like a vanity project, which is why it's surprising some of those moments are in there. But I can imagine. Methven watching and thinking, yeah, it's good there. I was good. I was strong. You know, I got my point across. I don't know that he thinks he's a prick when he watches it. Oh no, he probably doesn't. He probably has zero self awareness about who he is as a human being. Exactly. But that's but that's probably why he's someone who's probably got to where he has in life anyway. To be honest well, with you, maybe, yeah. You know. um, just the final kind of bits about Charlie. Sorry. Methven. MFN. <laughs> no, they're very small. It like I think that's the big bulk of it in the beginning in that episode. Um, I I loved the. I, I kind of hated, but I thought it's hilarious. You know, you got to kind of create the narrative around the <laughs> yes. games. Like just cutting to him making the most anodyne observations to his disinterested wife. Yes, yes. <laughs> was like, we could we could have a oh, we, we couldn't have a better free kick in this position. It was a right. <laughs> it was it was one bit of a quote is that they've got an overload. Got an overload. Overload on that side. Overload. Who are you telling? He also he also said the phrase at one point, heroically bad defending on a Napoleonic scale. Which Holy on its it's scale. Like, is any part of that correct? I mean, why is it heroically bad? Heroically bad isn't a thing. Horrifically bad is a thing. But heroically bad is weird. And then Napoleonic scale. Napoleon was famous for being small. <laughs> they're so, brilliantly bad at being, you know, in, in a in a very tiny way, they're brilliantly bad. <laughs> It was just like he'd watched. It was a bit like the, um, you know, the Armando Iannucci show sketch where, um, you know, he figures out they're all listening. They've all got earpieces earpieces to talk about the football. And it was a bit like he was being fed just anodyne football lines at times, definitely. (laughs) So. I love um, the, um, now I, you know, now I don't really want now, Rich. I I, I want a character like Charlie Methan to be played by Hugh Grant. I think like you could do a fictional version of this with just new plot lines, but you just Hugh Grant would play a prick, absolutely incredibly amazing, like just middle class tough prick. Hugh Grant would knock it out of the park. It'd just be amazing, and that's a compliment to Hugh Grant. That sounds like I'm kind of dissing Hugh Grant. I think he's a very good actor in a weird way. Um, so we can get on to Stuart Donald next. Just Let's I want to kind it. of a brief little kind of segue. Um, yeah. Here's one character I wish we had seen more of, Juan Satori. Yes. Oh, my God. I want to. I wish we could have more clips of this guy. <laughs> I love the bit, the first bit we kind of see this guy, or not the first bit, the first main bit, was when he asks, he asks Stuart Donald, what are the fans chanting? Which the, the chant is <laughs> the greatest, was it? Uh, the Sunderland ever far the greatest uh, team in the world. I've ever seen. And when it gets explained to him, he gives this real joyous reaction. The delight he's never of heard. The he's got such an excited look on his face. <laughs> Oh yeah, he's a, real said, he's a real treat. a real treat. I basically said I really want to see more of him. Um, <laughs> maybe you could give us some Eric Cantona-like poetry about the seagulls in, in uh, Sunderland. <laughs> 
<laughs> Excellent. The other, just the last final, final bit on, on on Charlie from me is uh, another sort of spoiler. No bugger turns up for the semi final when they're in the playoff semi finals, <laughs> and I was like, shouldn't that have been a bigger push than Boxing Day? And it was was it because there was nobody left to promote it because Charlie is such a poisonous character. Everyone else is gone. That is very true. That is very <laughs> very true. Completely <laughs> right. So Stuart Donald. A businessman? Donald, a businessman. Um, let's just say something I thought was interesting that we uh, we very quickly... Um, um, Stuart Donald's conflicting interest in Oxford United ironed over pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, just mentioned, never mentioned again. <laughs> he owns 10% of a club in the same league as Sunderland, but it's never mentioned. <laughs> Yeah, I said I, uh, my first line about him was Stuart Donald, a businessman who also owns a bit of Oxford United, and then immediately <laughs> seems a bit out of his depth. <laughs> there was a scene in the first episode where he sat at a laptop exclaiming about the um, <clears throat> the wage bill, and I was like, surely you should have known this ahead of time. Was like, it was last year; it was thirty three million. <laughs> <laughs> Surely this is not the first time so, you've seen this, Stuart. You should have wonder, looked at this before you bought a football club. Because I, I don't, I would love to know. I wish they'd had a bit more on this. Actually, I don't know if this is uh, Charlie or Stuart. Can can we talk about the bit with the players drilling in seats? Yes. So, um, as much as I, I want to kind of say it felt very Wednesday era under Stratford of fans paying the seats. Yes. Yeah. And um, the, I'm just this, wondering. Some similar, do you know, actually, as a duo, the similarities to uh, Parker and Stratford are, were, did sort of cross my mind more often than, you know, more than I mean, a couple of times am, whilst watching the show. I was a massive, and I still am to this day, I'm a massive fan of Lee Stratford. I thought what he was trying to achieve, mm. it, was, it was ambitious, but it was something in this, this world of not having any kind of leadership and direction. Yes, to have uh, to have some leadership was anything, and then some of the ideas and things he was trying to do was like, I guess this is a thing. I think if I would be chairman, maybe I'd be a bit like Lee Stratford himself because I would actually want to. That whole thing with the players drilling in the seats, it felt PRE. It felt a bit tin pot, but well, the, behind he, that, I think I kind of see the mentality of what exactly. they're trying to achieve. And the, the, you could see the thrill of the fans sort of interacting with the players. Um, although the bit with Luke 9 was was very funny. Um, so Luke 9 is a young player that's introduced a young, a, a new signing. And on the day of the uh, the, the day that they're putting in these new chairs, um, one of the fans is talking to Luke 9 and going, um, "Who's you know big." It seems a thoroughly to skip ahead a little bit. Seems a thoroughly nice chap. You know, he's, he he's big, he big hearted and really yes. this is big day. Is get, getting to sign for Sunderland is his moment of you know it's a big step along the road for him. But this fan says you should sign the back of it because it'd be good. You know, one day if you make it. <laughs> And it's like this young lad who's really thinking, probably like, I, I am making it. This is, this is me. I have made it. I'll and, kind of step in a little bit. The, the thing I want to say, this is more kind of about the players. I mean, I want to say the yeah. board thing because it's, it's kind of instigated by them, right? Mm. And I, I just said those poor bastard players having banter with the fans. <laughs> Cringe fest. Also, Cringe the, fest. Yeah. It's it's like I identify with that, uh, but I'm also powering half of Calgary with the shame of my red face. <laughs> I, this is coming from me, who, as you probably remember, Rich, and maybe I'm ashamed to admit on this podcast, but um, I won a Coca-Cola training day with the team. <laughs> this yeah. was about the uh, beginning of the first season in League One. Uh, Rich and I went down to the training ground in June. I think it yes. was June. Um, we met Lee Grant. Uh, four days before he was sold to Burnley. Yes, yes. Which was heartbreaking. And um, I'm still probably pretty embarrassed about the things I've done in my life. Maybe me saying to Clinton Morrison, I can't wait to see you bang them in in League One. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Clinton Morrison kind of uh, very awkwardly saying yeah mate 
Um, so I, I could kind of identify with the fans, but I really hated seeing those moments of the fans. <laughs> like, yeah, was it one of the, whether, like just to kind of the one the fans was like asking one of the players how he did in his GCSEs. <laughs> yes, and I was like, don't do that, don't do that. You know, his you know his uncle. You know, how you get your GCSEs. <laughs> Yeah, I did all right. Got nine. Nine! Wow, wow, wow. Fucking hell. Fucking hell. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not a very comfortable human being. I don't know how to talk to people. But I know that's not how you talk to people anymore. I don't know. I don't know how you talk. To... Oh, fuck. I don't know. This is this is bad. Anyway. So, we're still going through the board. We're going to talk about Stuart Donald. Stuart Donald. Um... <laughs> Um, so lots of platitudes about how you know oh it's such a great club and the fans are so great and the city's you know the 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 club is the city and the city is the club all that sort of stuff um i did make a comment <laughs> this is harsh and I, i'm sorry about this but um I, did, I said did his wife's face cost more than the club uh, because <laughs> there is not a lot of movement uh, from mrs donald did face. you know actually not mrs donald i think it's Stuart donald's girlfriend oh because as i found out on the, research on the internet um i was just curious more about who she was as a person um she was actually a stripper ah. who Stuart donald met and then l- apparently left ah. his wife Gross. of four kids for right um so yeah i'm not sa- i'm just saying that's what i'm reporting what i've read online hearsay and instance. rumor and myths of rumors but it's a allegedly allegedly um I and I, actually, I thought it was quite a nice that element of it. I thought she was very supportive. Oh, I, I like, nice. it's, I, it like just... I like their relationship. Um, I I love the whole thing with you know her saying to him, they're having that conversation in the kitchen. Yes, of, uh, his place. I love the the shot of him on the phone by the by the fish pond, trying to fish out a football, fish out a plastic flyway from the uh, fish pond. Yes. That was good. Um, but um, they're having that conversation and she's like, she's like, you know, I'm, you know, kind of basically like I'm worried about the time you're putting into this stress, how unhappy yes. it's making you. And how people, nasty people, people are. How nasty Christian people are to you and attacking you. And I, I loved how, what was it? I, I just need to find my note here. What was he saying about this? Well, um, he said the kids love it. The kids <laughs> love it. Exactly. I'm like the classic. Um, if you ask the kids, they'd want me to keep it. The classic um, using the kids to justify owning Sunderland. The classic <laughs> kids love me owning this football gambit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so his main so if, if Charlie's sort of main storyline is the the Boxing Day push, his main storyline is is transfer deadline day in January. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Which um, um, what can I say from this? I well, love, John, I <laughs> love it when he fires fires up the Will Grigg YouTube videos and gets an <laughs> erection. <laughs> So, uh, also going back as well, just to kind of, um, just to kind of go back, I loved, there's this whole plot line just kind of pushing in with Josh Marger, which yes. we will cover when we kind of go into the players, but I love the conversation. Who's, who's this kind of like, is it his scout or his kind of advisor, the ball chap? Do you yeah, remember him? I didn't know, who, I didn't know what his job was. But he was kind of a handholder for Stuart hand and they're having that, fit, you know. And I love the fact they're talking about the contracts. And he gets a bit of paper out, and he's writing. He's writing down the players' out contracts on a scrap of paper. <laughs> it's like he's on the phone. He's like he's doing doodles. I'm like a true chairman scribbling down papers out of contracts on a scrap of paper. <laughs> My God. So that's yeah. So the, the, player wise, we we focus on a few different players, but Josh Madger is 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 one of the main sort of stays of that. He leaves in January, uh, signs for Bordeaux, I believe. So then transfer deadline day 
they've got to sign a striker. That's the big drama. It and kind of uh, glimpsed over Josh Marger leaving very quickly. I mean, it was this big, <laughs> it was this big storyline, but it, it felt like, I'm like, I knew he left, but they didn't, I don't think they really covered it very well. I, I at least want like a minute on it, you know? I don't know. Anyway, sorry, carry on. No, it's all right. No, no, no. The, yeah. It, it, for all the time it takes leading up to that point, they didn't spend very much time talking about it when it happened. You're right. Um, I mean, it's one of those where you can kind of, well, we can talk about that in the play a bit. But so th- this situation they're in, um, at one point on the phone, uh, he he's on the phone. I don't know who he's on the phone to, whether it's a club or an agent. But he says, um, the price is 10 million. Offer them 1 million and say it's all we've got. <laughs> Which is such a rubbish gambit, a sort of like football manager esque. Well, we could try and get Messi for a fiver. Just see what they say. See what they say. Mm-hmm. You never know. <laughs> but my main I sort will... of thing... God, so yeah. So I mean, history is kind of outlined the transfer of this pretty heavily. Yeah. But I think even from the outset. I, I remember with, um, actually it was around this time, I remember, you know, the Sun journalist Arne Nixon talking about this deal when it was kind of brewing up. Mm. And he was saying, you know, in his kind of, not huge details, just very kind of quick fire Twitter, Twitter tweets, just saying it's, it's a staggering deal. Like, it's a lot yeah. of money they're offering. Yeah. And... My God, Wigan played an absolute blinder on this one. They did. <laughs> it was some top class fishing, really. Is they so they it seems like they bid a mil a million for him early doors. And there's actually the last conversation he has with Jack Ross as the manager as he's sort of he sort of calls him as he's leaving the training ground to say, Don't spend. I think they'd <laughs> gone up to one point two five million. And Jack Ross says to him, not He's not worth it. anything more than that. Don't spend anything more than that. He's not worth it. And then, fast forward to the end of the day, uh, you know, Charlie, B- well, Stuart Big Potatoes uh, bids three million pounds, basically, for Will Grigg. Three installments of a million pounds. So massively, massively overplays for overpays for a bang bang average player in Will Grigg. I mean, we all know what Will Grigg is, and he is the sort of guy that will get thirty goals in the SPL, some goals in League One, and barely ever score in the Championship. He's so average. He can shoot on target, and at lower levels, that's all you need because goalkeeping is so bad. But awful, sort of massively overpaying. And I did sort of say, transfer deadline day um, just seems to be the sort of gaggle of wannabes trying to play fourth-dimensional chess that it seems to be on the outside. All this nonsense and brinkmanship and playing games and, oh, they want 10, offer them one, and all that sort of stuff. And it's just like, I don't know why people can't just be adults about it and here's what we've got do you want to sell him yes or no do you know what i mean it's just like i know i know <laughs> and as you say wigan knew exactly they knew wait long enough and they and sunderland will spend stupid money because there's nobody else that could get so they did they and did then it, it seems like they would put over a barrel by will griggs agent as well because mm. lo and behold when you make an 11th hour massive bid for a striker the player wants to have a say in it and and make a lot of money for himself and his agent as well so <laughs> So, which if you were being proactive and the mentality, you know, had the best mentality. If you had this mentality of, oh, I don't know, what was I reading now? It was a book a while back and it was looking at like a French club. I want to say, uh, who was it now? Who had like a really strong kind of director of football and vision. Okay. And basically, their mentality was look, you buy a player, you build him up, you know, but you, the season before you sell him, you buy someone else to take his place. Yeah. Yeah. And then that player trains up the road to take the mantle and you have this continual, if it works well, if it works as well as it can, it's you should have a conveyor belt of talent. Yeah. And I'm like, they knew Josh Marger was playing this brinksmanship with them, was probably going to leave. They knew he was going to go, really, didn't they? They knew he was going to go. So why didn't they get someone for a more reasonable fee at the beginning of the January transfer window? But it is, it's because they all they're all tin pot businessmen playing games and they think they're clever so he will think he's going to grab himself a bargain by waiting late mm. they will think well the longer we wait the better the more he'll bid and it just all ends up hurting everybody all round and yeah. you end up with you end up overpaying for a player uh, overpaying his wages for years and years so the, you know the 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 panic of that transfer a bit like 
I mean, the again, the kind of echoes a bit like our Jordan Rhodes purchase. Yeah, will, I completely agree. Will will harm Sunderland for years yeah. because Sunderland fast forward to when the season stopped this year were on the outskirts of the playoffs, so it was not a given mm-hmm. that they were going to be promoted again. So they have paid Premiership. A premiership transfer, well, a championship transfer fee, championship or maybe even a premiership wages to this player. And they are continuing for a a second and third year in the same division. So the the toll on the club of not planning, not doing things in the right time, not being sensible earlier in the window is massive. But it's all just people thinking they're, you know, they're brilliant genius businessmen. They've all read Art of Deals, so they know how to make a deal like Trump. (laughs) Anyway, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> Do we so, should we leave Stuart there or you got well, I, I, I wanted to say um who is that guy that the bald headed chap? I don't know his name, but But I wanted to say just my notes, find yourself someone to slap your face fondly and repeatedly <laughs> when you're haggling for an overrated fur tier striker. <laughs> All the thrill of spunking four million on Bill Grigg. <laughs> Again, I'm like, they should have gone for Gary Medin. Yeah. Maybe they could have got Nile Ranger in. I don't know. Like, anybody. Anybody. Yeah. But, like, yeah. spend, don't spend. So, and like, and again, all the joy of, like, the way they presented it was like, he just discovered this guy on YouTube, you yeah. know? Yeah. And like, and he'd, like won. he'd done a brilliant thing getting Greg in. I don't know. <sighs> Wild. And, Wild. and then the, fight, the 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 bit maybe just he said you know you got to spend twenty million to make a dent in the third tier. I'm like, what are yeah. they what are they paying people? Well, well, so we should move along to the players, which is which would be their biggest. Just, uh, uh, can I add a little kind of few small kind do. of things about the boards? Um, I didn't like Charlie Methen calling them season cards. No, hated that. That was instantaneous as well. That was my first like introduction on the local radio station, and he called it a season card. It was like immediately. Do you want to mark yourself out to be a prick in ten seconds flat? Say season card. <laughs> Just such a loafer and no socks thing I to say. Loved your reaction to that, Rich. It was like it was very much like the meme of Michael Scott saying, "No, <laughs> no, don't like that." <laughs> Just call them season tickets. I'm like, uh, as another thing I've said, maybe give them a football ratchet, but to take the edge off the season cards language. Maybe that just kind of brings things back a bit. Um, I really hated the red and white ties that they all wore. Yes. Uh, Pony, as Southerners would deservedly put it, bobbins, as maybe our Mancunian friends would call it. (laughs) So like a third-rate fictional public school tie in a bad video game where you play as a bully. (laughs) Excellent. <laughs> I think that's about it for the uh, the the fans forum bit smacked of Wednesday. Even though I think it's something that a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, I love the bit about um, uh, Stuart Donald saying we should get rid of the cryo chamber because the only thing that was using it was, was Martin Bain with you. I love that. I love that. <laughs> so they've got this this sort of um, yeah. <laughs> Um, um, I'm trying to think what it's uh, what they're called. Those it's a portal cabin with <laughs> with a cryo chamber in it, and uh, yeah, they figured out that nobody used it apart <laughs> apart from Martin Bain, who Bain was last was season back, Charlie back Methven. Yeah. He played Mar- he played Charlie Methven in season one. Yeah, um, <laughs> as I put in my comments, no, not the cryo chamber, and I said, hopefully Joe Rogan doesn't get word they're shifting their two flotation tanks. <laughs> I think I'd like to. I'd like to think that um, when it was getting shipped away, Martin Bain was in there just sneaking in another little free, uh, free freeze for his back. I can say, you know, filling his pockets with some Nes- Nespresso pods on the way out. <laughs> exactly. Um, what was the last bit I wanted to say about the board? It was. Can I just say, as a board decision during that like uh, Boxing Day game, don't. Like I understand, so the, the theme tune, which I absolutely despise, this is more of a show thing. I really hate that theme tune for passion. <laughs> I said, I, I've got a note as well. I hate the theme tune, and I'm a man who gets soppy about the plight of work, the working man and tunes about lost industry. But I hate <laughs> the theme tune. <laughs> But why did they have the band come on stage to do the theme tune? Because oh. now I only associate that song with the disaster of the first season. That documentary. As everyone should, yeah. But um... yeah. Mind you, I guess the time it was released, it was probably not out then, I guess, because we're a year behind. Maybe, so maybe that. Um, also, the, the chairman's going, the board going on a podcast. Yes. 
and getting asked some really like <clears throat> you know, like Stuart Donald was getting into some business about tactics and Will Grigg and things like that. And just like you should not don't why are you saying these things on in a public forum? Yeah. And, yeah, but then yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the notes I put sort of like so those two pushed for them to to that they want they got to the they didn't win they got to the Checker Trade uh, Trophy final the the trip to Wembley which was pushed by the the two sort of bods at the top and then lo and behold the players have played a whole season plus another like ten games which is what always happens with that trophy and they're knackered towards the end and they completely mm. fall away they just about make the playoffs. And at no point do they take any blame for the fact that they've knackered out their squad. Um, and, and, you know, the, the Will Grigg thing, immediately pouring, when he was asked about Will Grigg not fitting in with the tactics, immediately pouring the blame on Jack Ross when we've all seen the video of Jack Ross saying, don't spend that much money on him, he's not worth it. So Jack mm-hmm. Ross would rather not have spent £3 million of a budget he doesn't have on Will Grigg. He would have rather gone with what he had, but given the player that he you know, didn't want to ever spend on, he's got now got to make got to play him and and when it doesn't work it's his fault. Uh, which does sort of give you an idea of how thankless a task it is to be a manager in these current systems where you're not in control of your your transfers and budget. <sighs> anyway, should we move on to Jack Ross? Yes, Jack Ross. So um as I think I've put in my notes, an identical Scottish manager, Jack Ross. Uh, just a dreek grey man. Dude, I, I loved it when he came into the club and then I said I really enjoy him being shown the pictures from his office window. Probably a bit nippy outside even for a Scotsman. <laughs> uh, I, he's, I thought he came across as an alright guy. I don't know. He, no, he, he did. He much. did. I, I think he's probably, if we look at this trio of football managers who've featured so far in the Sunderland Till I Die documentaries, um, Simon Grayson um, felt a bit he Simon yeah. Grayson for the first a bit hard done to he had that hard done to yeah. mentality yeah. yeah but I think he kind of carried that himself which I don't think really helps his situation no I don't particularly get him as a football manager and no, I don't think that documentary did anything to make me think he's very kind of workman like yeah you know but I, I I know we right now we're under Gary Monk's reign, but I think that Gary Monk is a far more kind of practical and kind of measured character. I I think he Gary Monk has a lot more to him than I yes. think that it's than is given off on someone like Gary Monk. Um, Chris Coleman was hilarious, but he's I don't know. I feel he's a bit of a he's almost like a Martin Bain or a Charlie Meffin as a football yeah. manager. Really, you know, you can see he's he's a very charming guy. And an incredible confidence. Like he yes. never, the veneer of, like you talk about people who are like, I'm sure it's like a sort of sports psychology type thing, but like people who, he just has a shield of confidence that was just unbreakable. <laughs> Even though he was in, he's parachuted into a terrible situation, it got worse, it didn't get any better. And he just never, there was never any kind of glimmer of a waver in him at all. It was really fascinating to see. But a, a really resolute character. It's, as you say, seems very charming. He's obviously a, a, a handsome dude as well, which doesn't mm. hurt. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but hopeless as a manager, a club manager at the very least. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's funny. I yeah, I I think he, the Jack Ross kind of came off pretty well. There's something there is a very kind of Scottish practicality. <laughs> yes. Um, similar to a lot of Scottish managers we've seen. You know, I think about think about our own previous Alan Irvin. Yeah. Um, who we who we met on that day and was a very nice man. Yes. Uh, I think League One is weirdly quite. If you're a kind of stoic Scottish rock of a person, mm. it's kind of the league for you because mm. it's very physicality goes a long way. So having bi- a couple of big strikers, a couple of big defenders, and folks in the middle who can run about a bit, it's kind of the way to win League One or do well in League One. It's a yeah. very kind of meat and potatoes league, mm. um, and I think that's it, those sort of basics. 
<laughs> seem to be drilled into Scottish managers, maybe in a way that doesn't get, I don't know, maybe a, more English managers have like, ideas above their station or something. I don't know. But, no, um, I really want a meat and potato pie, Rich. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but Hanson's relish on it. Lovely. Uh, um, anyway, sorry. Any more on Ross? So the big bit that was, it's right near the beginning. Uh, he comes in, I, I guess you don't know whether this is him. This is the first time we're seeing him interact with the players. And he comes into the dressing room and he gives a firm but comfortable iron brew take on a black handshake with two black. <laughs> <laughs> so it was awkward even before those guys uh, make eyes at each other in silence at the end of the yes. clip. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that moment vividly now. <laughs> it, it it sticks with you. It really yeah. does. Yeah. And um but I mean outside of that, the interesting thing is I mean there's not much focus on him, but I mean yeah, yeah. he's he does well. You know, he does um he does as well as he probably can with what he's been given. Yeah. Uh, even even if he, you know, in the the JPT, sorry, checker trade, checker trade, uh, checker trade, dot com. Is it checker trade com? Okay, so even well, if he comes, um, it, no, that's their um, their uh, jingle on Talksport. They're, they're a regular oh, sponsor excellent. on checker trade, checker trade dot com. He has a tough tough battle because I mean he loses he loses as a star striker who's you know in Josh Marger. Um, probably did about as well as he could with the tools he had. I think. I think you you always hope for a, a manager who's always going to get that extra that extra you know squeeze of juice out of the uh, the orange from this. Um, as, I'd like to say, Rich, that uh, even in the checker trade final, he came up against Kenny Jacket, who yes. I've noted are Kenny Jacket the villain in every lower league pantomime. <laughs> I just I loved seeing Kenny Jacket there. Kenny Jacket on Netflix. It just pleased me. <laughs> deeply, deeply pleased me. I don't know why. Yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> but that's I mean, the the yeah, the reality of it is he he was doing a pretty bang up job until he lost Madger. Madger had got fifteen goals in twenty four games, which is a stunning strike rate. Um how much of that was Madger being too good for League One, or how much was Jack Ross's positive influence? One losing that would just be very hard for anyone. And the goals that you saw Madger scoring were quite often turning very unpromising situations into goal scoring opportunities. Mm. Like he would be backing into a defender and suddenly pivot and put it in a corner. Um, he was he was sort of pulling rabbits out of hats for a lot of those goals rather than tap-ins from lovely play from everyone else. So losing him and his ability to create goals on his own was a massive, massive loss for them. And the fact that they still got to the playoffs final and the checker trade final, I think is a testament to the fact Jack Ross seems a pretty decent manager from the outside looking in anyway. Mm, but yet he's not there anymore, right? Is that right? I I don't think he is. No, it's, uh, it's Phil Parkinson now. Right. It's League One journeyman Phil Parkinson. <clears throat> so I, I don't really know what happened there. I'm just going to have a quick look at that while we're kind of talking. Um, is this the bridge to kind of talk about some of the players? I think so. That we have. So he actually left at the beginning of October last year, Jack Ross, with um, a 50% win rate. Yeah. Played 60 games, 30 wins, and that's only seven losses. Derek, those two at the top want this immediate success, really. But how you do that whilst you're drastically cutting back on playing costs, I'm not sure. Because they're relying on so so to, to come to players, they, they don't make any real feature of uh, probably the most important couple of players for the team, which is Ada McGeady and, and Chris Maguire, um, mm. formerly of the Wednesday Parish. Um, <clears throat> but McGeady is a perma injured waste of a talent. So if your whole squad is pivoting on how how often and how well Aidan McGeady plays for you, it's going to always be a real struggle yeah. with anything going. But that is where they're at. It, it's kind of where they've been for three years. Whoever signed Aidan McGeady wants shooting, really. But um, let's, 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 let's focus on players in general. So... so- I guess the interesting thing right at the beginning, they talk about that coverage and Didier Nadong was their record signing. Yes. So he left and I was like, who? (laughs) Yes. 
He spent 13 million on him. Wild, isn't it? And Rodwell went as well, and you know that's probably fair. I, I thought it was interesting the fact that they covered the fact about Stuart Donald in the pacing around his office trying to shift Catamol, saying yes. it's diff- difficult to shift. And intriguing about that for the fact that, like, I think the year later they did get shot of him, a year later. Um, and we were linked to him. We were linked with him as well. There's a lot of Wednesday connections. There's a lot of Wednesday linking. There's a lot of ex-Wednesday players. Um, Stephen Fletcher leaving was one of the things that freed up some of their wage bill. In previous they years. Go. Uh, they let him go. It would have been that season i think wouldn't it have been that summer when they went down is when we signed fletcher i think is that right or is it a year before i, I it, don't know there was a basically they flashed onto a sky sports thing where um they were showing how much money sunderland had lost on players because they spent big fees on players and then right. they that's why they put them up so I'm I think yeah okay. they paid nine million pounds for and then he ended up leaving on a free so they didn't make a penny back um, so whenever that happened, you know, it's another little sort of nod towards this is a club that wasn't isn't being run particularly well. Yeah. Um, but so what else is going to kind of say? So um, as we're kind of looking into um, a period of time where unfortunately a lot of people and I do apologize wholeheartedly if you're someone who's affected and we're coming to this unfortunate reality that there are going to be a lot of redundancies and layoffs. Mm. Uh, I'm sure there are HR managers looking on admiringly at the fact that squad was decimated in that summer from that thing. It's like, yeah. it's like here's another spoiler. It's like Thanos clicked his fingers on that first team squad. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, it's a a sort of pleasing uh, thing that they flash up on the screen when it goes like. You, they, know, you know, I was actually envious of them wiping wiping the board clean as much. Yes. Um, we can kind of look ahead. I just want to kind of do a summary because I actually went ahead previously and I'm not sure how this is kind of given to me information from a website. I'm not sure how good or this information is, but essentially that season they signed 21 players and Ooh. they, I think, sold slash released from the previous season going to this one, 22 players. Right. So it's a huge, huge overhaul. Yeah, which, yeah. The funny thing then, again, I know there's the expectation they need to get promoted, but for someone like Jack Ross to do maybe as well as they have yeah. in that situation is probably quite admirable. And you're replacing generally fairly proven senior pros with guys like Luke O'Neill, who are very mm. young, very green, maybe shown a bit of promise early doors. But, you know, it's like it's a centre back that they signed for 200k from uh, Peterborough. It's uh, the, the striker, I think, cost 900k. Um, you know, they're, they're sort of replacing proven talents, expensive talents with hopeful, you know, hopeful punts on, on promising futures. Not So, yeah, as I say, I, by and large, I, I'm, it, um, I didn't know that Ross had been removed. Uh, it looks like they were. If you look at the Wikipedia, they were sixth when they got when they got rid of him. They are now seventh. So mm. I just it seems strange to sort of want instant results in that position. But yeah, but again, I could probably feel a similar thing would probably happen at Wednesday. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so yeah, uh, Chris Maguire came in. They didn't focus at all on Glenn Leuvens, who did actually sign that summer. I know he's not there anymore. They actually, last year and uh, just before the, the beginning of the season, they let him go. They actually, yeah, you know, mutually agreed to tear up his two-year contract. Um, yeah, this, this a McGee, year in. who's already got an injury at the start of the season. There's Christmas mm-hmm. Gohaya that they sign. You see him signing. Uh, uh, the link, the link with Wednesday, George Honeyman. We were linked with him. Yeah. Captain. Um, you know, previous player Aidan McGeady, like you mentioned, who also we were linked with as well, fairly like in <laughs> January, which was insane. Uh, Jack Baldwin, I think, was actually linked with Wednesday. I see. Right. Okay. So he's a Peterborough centre half who I think. Oh, so they followed him a little bit, didn't they? They followed him a little bit, yeah. And I don't exactly think he did. Well. He wasn't. I, I think, uh, from what I've found out, he's not a player who's done too well in his career yeah. there. Um, I'm disappointed we didn't get any more Chris Maguire. I would have loved to follow Chris Maguire around. He w- surely he would be a, would have been a fun character to do. And you know they had the few moments of him, you know, being uh, Chris Maguire, the one, the wind up merchant. Yes. Just, uh, given given a few people, you know, the Chris Maguire, <laughs> Chris Maguire bants. And he's uh, so like he's so involved in everything on the pitch, like the clips of matches. 
Mm-hmm. It's Maguire again and again and again. Uh, he takes all the set pieces. He's crossing the ball in for almost every goal. It, it would. It's weird. It, in, in a lot of ways, it's weird that he, he's not featured at all, and neither is Gooch. Lyndon Gooch is another player that mm. features prominently in the, the the actual football clips, but doesn't. We never see him interviewed or, or sort of on camera particularly. So I guess the big focus is probably. You know, we have we have Luke 09. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll just talk about Luke 09 first. Um, a player who I kind of said he's like if Nando was from Hem- Hemel Hempstead. <laughs> yes. He yeah. has that kind of very youthful exuberance. Um, so much youthful exuberance. Another note of mine is basically I've heard he's the biggest exporter of bum fluff in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> he, to be honest, he looks so youthful that. I'm not even sure he's at the bum fluff stage. He's he looks like he would struggle to produce some bum fluff. I loved when he, you know, he's just so kind of yeah, so much, you know, this bit after the game. I think he scored and he went after one of the games and he goes into the, you know, the um, you know, does the you know after match kind yes. of sh- schmoozing with the Schmooz- um, yes. schmoozing with the hoi polloi or people that are there, and then like there's him and some small kid did a little uh, did a little handshake. Yes, yeah, and it felt like they were, you know. Brothers separated a couple of years apart, really. <laughs> he just seemed really just a nice young guy. <laughs> like, he was. Very excited he was. to be there, um, enthusiastic. And he kind of seemed to go with, you know, the, the swings of the uh, of momentum and emotion mm. seasons <clears throat> to affect him every time as well. Um, I also liked the fact... So he got too excited in his first game and got taken off at half time because he was knackered and then we cut to him enjoying a jaffa cake uh on the sidelines did he really i just uh, forgot that that was just pretty good (laughs) i think the interesting thing is i mean you need that you know i think something we're probably missing at wednesday i think it's interesting to say like you need those characters in the dressing room with people like jose Semedo, who are the maybe the kind of the positive forces in the in the dressing room who are the more the kind of elder statesmen who are kind yeah. of show that leadership. But I think you really need to see, especially with a player like Luke 09, I think you need that youthful exuberance from yeah. players. And that energy, that sort of yeah. pleasure to be here. Mm-hmm. You know, we've won the lottery that we get to do this for work every day. Mm. It's definitely something you need in there. And it was almost one of my sort of three things for the for the season, uh, or three things for sort of rebuilding Wednesday, was so, some youth players to kind of stick around. Because that yeah. happened. I think it's it's also important for the fans. We love to see our homegrown players come in. I know he's not homegrown, but like seeing a young player come in and shine and sort of continue to get better is is one of the pleasures of watching the football club. And if everybody's 29, <coughs> 30 years old playing the last two, three years at the top level, it's a bit, you don't get any of that. You don't get any of that enthusiasm in the dressing room. And you don't get any of that excitement as a fan. I couldn't work out where he plays. Because he seemed to come on for strikers quite often. <laughs> At one point, he cleared the ball off the line. I, I just couldn't look at what his position was. I think he's a bit of a kind of... In behind he, the strikers. I just wonder if he's a bit of a kind of defensive midfield, okay. defend midfield, kind of anywhere across that. I think, you know, definitely you can see his kind of, uh, his kind of attitude to play anywhere. I just want to play. So just put me anywhere on the pitch. I'll do a job anywhere. He plays as a midfielder or a defender. There you go. Okay, yeah, so. I, I read the same thing as well because I, I did a bit of looking up of him because, you know, yeah, he's an interesting <laughs> interesting young man. Um, I guess the next big focus is uh, Josh Marger, who we mentioned. Yeah. Uh, the commentator said all his goals are deceptive finishes, <laughs> which I kind of said, what the fuck about that? Really, I didn't. <laughs> do you think didn't. I was borderline racist? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe so. <laughs> uh, I will say about Josh Ma- Maja, uh, he is a coy little devil. Uh, <laughs> he's a cheeky, blind-faced little liar, like some uh, cute girl you take a shine to, but she strings you along because you're a gullible schmuck, and it's kind of fun to get the attention. <laughs> Episode 3 says, I'll be here next year, he lies to an old woman. It's on well, the way, he lies to children. Yeah, but what's he, he can't say, can he? I know, I know he can't. Because that goes, I, 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 that moment I thought, I did think, I thought a couple of things. I thought, I thought, what can he do, really, other than that? And then the other thing I thought was, I bet that's immediately gone on Twitter slash a message board, because that's the sort of thing that goes around 
places like ours talk about <laughs> old fighter, isn't it? I spoke to Josh Madger after the game today and he said he'd be here next year. Oh, great. Okay, good. Bit of reassurance. <laughs> but um, yeah, I also liked when he was asked sort of pointedly asked about his contract and then uh by the the filmmakers and then he was sort of they focused on his he was giving a very straight-faced answer but they were focusing on the fact that he couldn't stop sort of twitchily drumming yeah. on the side of the... i know i i don't <laughs> know what uh to be serious i i also feel you know i don't really know what else he's really going to say in that kind of situation exactly. you yeah. know he's he's there in the position you know i thought it was kind of interesting or I, I think about a lot this with players like especially the Wednesday players some of the ones who aren't quite blessed with the talent to kind of score goals and kind of change games mm. how much they rely on those players for their livelihood like because you remember like Luke 09 saying you know I remember there was like a shot of them on the training ground yes yeah and Luke 09 was kind of um, you know he said you know I say to Madge every day he's got to stay yeah because I guess the interesting thing, the actions of what the people do raise your raise your profile as a player. Like Definitely, yeah. They, if he just I, stayed and signed a contract, maybe he could have gotten the goals that got him into yeah. the championship and then certainly did a hell of a lot better. I imagine he would do a hell of a lot better staying on than Will Grigg did. Um, I, I thought it was sweet how he knew how many goals he'd got and like was celebrating with him when he got to, to 10. Luca, Luca, nine, and uh, at the end of the game, it's, like, it's ten for the season now. That's ten, you know. Like I thought, that was quite nice. Um, yeah, it's it's tricky because I think I think in that situation, obviously, the to an extent, you're you're getting the story that the chairman wants to be told. I think that's the kind of more than anything else, this feels a bit like a PR piece for Stu- for Stuart Donald. Um, mm-hmm. And in that saga with with uh with josh madger just the story you're they're trying to tell is oh this awful agent's turned his head but i think it was interesting i I don't i can't quite remember who said it but someone said you know he's these young players that have come through the academy now were sort of on the cusp of the first team when the club was still in the premier league so the money that they know is available to them is actually pretty staggering compared to probably what's available in league one and if you're Josh Madger, yes, there's a benefit to staying in Sunderland. I, I think this is a tr- the tough thing. You know, a football career is not a long career. No. Ten years is pretty much what you've got. So you're Josh Madger. You're right at the start of that. You've probably had a year of your ten years of, of being a, a, a sort of top draw footballer. And you've also, this season, you've scored 15 goals in 24 games. Last season, you barely scored at all. <laughs> you've got to kind of strike while the iron. <laughs> Part to an extent. Yeah. That's the sensible thing to do. Yeah, I agree. No matter how much loyalty you have to the to the club and to the fans or whatever else, your main loyalty, like all of us, we you know we've got to be loyal to ourselves. And um, and he's got to get his priorities in order. So from his point of view, he's like thinking, well, yeah, I'm getting offered this, probably a lot less than he would have been offered if through no fault of his own, they were in the league above or there were two leagues above. Um, and his agent will know what players in his situation are getting paid as well. So this is the time to to make hay, to make, make some money for himself. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, I can see his part. I can see his agent's part. And I can also see that the club are, you know it it leaves them in a bad spot but it's um it's just the way of the world unfortunately and when you're in league one you don't get to make all those decisions for yourself even man united can't keep hold of a player if they want to leave you saw that with ronaldo yeah it's just interesting i thought it was good it was kind of interesting to be that close to one of those scenarios and again like at wednesday we've kind of seen that happen recently you know we've had it with with george hurst we've had it with to an extent with penny uh and sean clare you know seeing the chairman's position where it's like you know why are we not making getting them to sign contracts with that favor the club mm. and the um i always find i think it's interesting i always want to see I find it interesting in situations where, you know, you talk about like the big, the big players at big clubs who want to leave. You think about like Liverpool with uh, Philippe Coutinho, mm. who batted his eyelashes and wanted to move to um, Barcelona. Yes. You know, I don't know if it, 
if it was kind of common knowledge or whether it was purely just conjecture, but I, I thought this was the case, and maybe you can corroborate or deny me on this one, Rich, but I, I thought the, the club kind of said to him, look, um, sign a new contract, we won't let you leave this year, but next year you can go. Yeah. And I'm wondering if they could have done some type of thing like that with him. Well, they had him on contract for the year. What they didn't want to do was lose out on a payoff. So they yeah. didn't need to let him go but they they did if they wanted to get paid for him being there so i mean how much did i don't even know how much they he said it was a, like, a, a one and a half million or something like that so it wasn't but massive. if he's out of contract it's pretty yeah. good yeah and he's only had six months of good football in his whole career you know mm. <laughs> he's mainly not been that good and he was that good for a bit Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's 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 it is int- it's intriguing. So they they yeah they could have the gamble they could have taken is as the club is we keep him maybe he signs because I think you can sign for an overseas club on a pre contract arrangement. Uh, you can't sign for an English club until your co- your contract's finished. I think or or like till much closer to your contract finishing. So the 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 risk you run is that his head gets turned between now and the end. Yeah and his form drops off but <clears throat> there's no financial loss to you because if you're the if you're the league up league above then you're in a better position to offer him a contract the next time round as well mm-hmm. <clears throat> anyway so that's that was the josh Mad- madger saga and then that led us on to the will grig situation i like yeah that the, i like that he got a proper unveiling in front of the crowd that doesn't that happen nice. very often that was nice yeah <laughs> but he didn't Just, he didn't uh... think a huge amount either did he no there was scant attention paid to the players really yeah it's just frustrating i did enjoy a little bit on aiden mcgeady um who said about him i don't know what was it Stuart donald who said about him that he said he's the best attacking player in the league by a little margin so he said it, and then I said, "Wow, you know, there's like the, uh, you know, there's a meme about uh, from Anchorman where Will Ferrell says, well, that escalated quickly. That <laughs> D, that D escalated quickly. He walked that one back very quickly. <laughs> that uh, reminds me of, um, I don't know if you're aware of the work of Alex Horn, the comedian. Yes, a little bit. But yeah. He 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 talks about uh, conditional love songs, so or conditional song lyrics. So you know." You are so beautiful to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're simply also, the best. better yeah. than all the rest, better than anyone, anyone I've ever met, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. That's very, very good. Um, so the only thing I'd last to say, A.D. McGeady, crowned by the fans is way too good for this league. Um, but Luke said he's probably not good enough for the championship anymore. So wow. he lives in a vacuum between leagues, a handsomely paid black hole. Yeah. Yeah. He just looked a lot like our, the Aidan McGeady we had. A lot mm-hmm. of, uh, well, as we saw, a bit like the kind of Harris or Forrest, the everything of good enough to get you a little bit excited, but not good enough for it to pay off very often. Uh, it just looked like, yeah, he was just as likely to spoon it over the bar, which happens sort of 99 times out of 100. But one of them will go in and look really good. So there's enough to kind of keep you around. Uh, Maguire looked far more effective. It, uh, to, uh, to be honest, uh, the, the clips of the foot. So how do you feel, just touching on this sort of show in general, how do you feel about the, how they show the clips of football? I fucking hate. The thing yeah. I really fucking hated was <laughs> I get you need to slow motion things. I wish they would fucking stop with the um, the World Cup 66 film football sound effects. Yeah. It fucking drives me bananas. Seriously. <laughs> I just I can't stand it. it was... <laughs> you, replace it, you replace it with someone popping, um, popping bubble wrap, please. Can you do that? <laughs> please. Can you just make me a little bit better with that? It's just... just oh. So... I get the need to tell a narrative and it's, but I guess the funny thing is like, um, also want to comment from the first season. Um, also this season, what? No, um, they didn't focus on them getting uh, comfortably whipped by Wednesday at home in the League Cup. No, that kind of got covered. And the, the thing I hated in the first season was they made the um, they made the, uh, the first season they made the David Jones screamer oh, look yes. incredibly tame. Yes, I'm like, did. how did you do that? How did you manage to just take all of the weights off that goal? Well, I just don't like pitch side. That pitch side view is not a good way to watch football. No. 
it does make you worry. It does make you wonder about why managers are there. I know they're there to shout in people's ears, but to but get a good the role... game, it's the worst view possible. Yeah, I know. It's much you better if you actually... Fight. The game the... becomes less messy and more tactical as you add a bit of distance and height to your viewing perspective. Mm. Just being there and watching from the side, everything looks crap. Every, as you say, sounds crap. It's I just I don't like that. I like when they show the sort of TV footage of games, which is happens from time to time, because that's better. It's so much better than yeah, their, exactly. their kind of scrappy. I don't know. It's a bit like I don't know if you watched any of the Hobbit films in the um, the the fast sort of frames per second, the double frames per second. But but everything looked like it was filmed on a VHS. And there's a bit of that when they show matches from pitch side like that. It all looks a bit too real and messy. And <laughs> yeah. you want to elevate things and make it look exciting. But there you go. Oh, anything else on the players? Um, oh, here we go. I loved I loved when they talked about... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Loved it when they talked about Will Grigg eventually bagging a penalty and the commentator exclaimed that he is on fire finally when he's when he's actually black and smoky like a long child and forgotten about barbecue sausage. <laughs> he's just <laughs> I don't know whether it's not a looks thing, it's a sort of persona thing, but I would be just so disappointed if we'd spent I... so much money on such a kind of average looking no. Being. You know what I wish? Like you, you really summed up. Um, I, I think I'm kind of proud of our fan base that, like, I feel like Wednesday fans are very witty yes. and very funny with some of the chants. I, but I know, like, a lot of football fans are, are kind of like that. I wish there was more funny stuff from the terraces instead of some of the yeah. real anodyne, the real anodyne shitty comments. Like it just. It just drives me. Yeah. It's like, can we have something interesting? I'd love to hear someone just out of nowhere just say, uh, say someone's fucking shit or something yeah. like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, so, like, it's not even, that's not the height of wit, but it just keeps funny. <laughs> it's just, no, no, it's the height of wit, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> it is the height of wit. That's why I'm so funny. I think, uh, I think, again, sort of comment on the show, I think, I, d- I think it's well worth a watch again. I, I think it's it's a rare glimpse inside of a football team, uh, in, in, yeah, which you don't get very often at all. Football is a weirdly kind of closed off industry for how much time and attention we pay to mm. football and footballers. We don't actually get much behind the scenes. They're pretty closed shop. So I think I think it's worthwhile as an exercise in just it's kind of interesting just to see some of the behind the scenes bits and pieces. Well what did you think we had we had much less of a focus on the fans this So season. that's yeah, well that's I think the the difference between the two series is is the scope is so narrow in season two and it's to the detriment of it. I think it's far less interesting and fun for the fact that we don't spend as much time with players or fans in mm-hmm. season two. Or the or the characters around the club. I just said like the, the the chef at the training ground is is a really good character. The those sort of folks, the kit man's an interesting character. I, I'm less interested in just seeing the chairman and the marketing guy all the time. That's less interesting and, and kind of once we've done it, we've done it. Mm. Um and I did so it was nice to see some of the characters come back from the first season in terms of the fans. I really like the taxi guy. I was really pleased to see him come back. <laughs> See, it's the weird thing that like I relate to them, and they're they're you know they're the fine people, you know they're, yeah. they're just they, you know they are working class people, and the people who love their football club, and it's the fabric of this, and I get it. It's just sometimes it just gets a bit wanky. You can have too much of it, yeah. So but, maybe it was a little better, but then it just it felt weird, kind of remembering like you know like the uh, that guy is the the bearded chap. Yes. Um. I, I find it hilarious when they're all sitting around watching the news break on Sky Sports. <laughs> like Gogglebox. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> this fan base who I've commented, who enjoy a plate of mini Battenbergs at Christmas. <laughs> love Absolutely love a Battenberg, me. <laughs> and also in episode five, you know, have a Brexit march. Well, it was really funny that because I, I did make a comment about that because the taxi person was at the Brexit march. But then... I couldn't work out whether he was pro or anti Brexit, and then it by was the end weird. Of that, yeah, that was it actually really interesting. Like he, it's, it seemed like the film crew were like, "Oh, there's that Brexit march happening. We should, 
we should have it on somehow, shouldn't we? And then we they're like, who's, who's, them, who's available and got a car? Oh, the taxi guy. Call, um, Let's call get him taxi, there. Taxi Stewart or whatever his name is. Get him down there. Because he's he got... said it's like, it becomes a bit like a Philomena Kunk character. Just kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't, that thing. It it is funny. That is funny. But like, I just noticed with everything going on, I'm like, oh, oh excellent, the Brexit march. How tri- how trivial that all looks now. I know, but he because uh, he sort of says at the start because he goes, he says something. He says like, uh, oh, you know, most folks around here were in class. You know, these people are sort of people that voted for Brexit. Um, and then and then he said like, you know, um, if it ever does happen. You know, pray to God it doesn't. But so it's like, so do you not want Brexit? Like, are you protesting the protest? Is that why you're there? Or I couldn't work out why he was there. But he was just really a talking weird. head so that really they could weird. show Farage really and these 10 sad people wandering along the coastline. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I was amazed that the bearded man was only just turning 40. <laughs> uh, did well, I love the fact that he... Rapid. Um, I, I love the fact that he, he was spraying colour onto his beard yes. um, using cardboard like a cheap car spray paint job. <laughs> There's wow. a weird continuity thing there that sort of bugged me because he was spraying his beard. Then they showed him sort of leaving the house, getting his coat on, and he, his beard wasn't sprayed. And then he was at Wembley oh, with his beard dear. <laughs> Oh, dear. Continuity error. Oh, continuity. Classic Was it the fans as well? A small kind of, you know, I thought it was really sobering and depressing that they were having their derby against Newcastle. Oh, I know. Against the Newcastle under 21s. Yeah. And who who said this? I've written it down. It they talk about the checker trailer. It gets shown all over the world. <laughs> yeah. So as I put in my comments, there is a shown part all of all t- over the world, this. There is a part of Tibet that will be forever checker trade. <laughs> And those bright checker, checker trade lights that keep shining on. And, of course, those bright lights have been installed by a trustworthy esteemed tradesman, CheckerTrade.com. CheckerTrade, CheckerTrade.com. Um, and so uh, th- th- that is one of the kind of... I, f- I did feel for the fans, particularly the playoff final last one. You know, it's it's still fresh in my memory being on the losing side at, at at, in a playoff final at Wembley. Yeah. Wembley is a weirdly soulless corporate place to feel very human emotions. Um, and it, you could kind of see how out of place the sort of poor crying fans looked around that kind of big shiny glass and marble edifice of, uh, yeah. of Wembley. And and the fact that they had that twice in a twice season, in a season is I really know. cruel. Like the first time they're like, you know, we'll never get the chance to win at Wembley. You know, winning at Wembley is a big thing, which it is for people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, but I, I know it's another thing. I, I've noticed the fact that you can only ever pay play. In, in all seriousness, you can only ever play the occasion in front of you. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know what would kind. Of, but that was the weird thing because I mean, with our mentality, everybody was like the JPT came around. We're all like when we were in the third tier, and it was like this is a waste of time. Let's just yeah. put the kids out. I loved Megson's. Do you remember when Megson played them? So they yeah. brought in a rule where you had to play eight out of the 11 from the previous Saturday to try and sort of Ow. protect people putting out their worst possible 11 and, and just bowing out of this pointless, useless tournament. And uh, yeah, Megson made two substitutions <laughs> the second we kicked off. <laughs> that was oh, what just a trick. something else. <laughs> Oh, so I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? it was a, <laughs> did Weaver come off for? Yeah, Weaver was definitely one of the ones that came replaced off. by uh, Richard O'Donnell, I think. Yes, and maybe Rob Jones. Mm, I don't know. But right. Anyway, he sort of immediately took, yeah, took two, two players off. Brilliant. <laughs> and doing it on Sky as well. I know. I it was absolutely fuming. <laughs> um. You know those those fans. Um, are we gonna? I think we're gonna talk about the show now, and maybe talk about so. some of those. Yeah, let's, re- let's sort of round it off with a bit of. Yeah, comedy. no, I mean the show. Awful theme song. Awful, 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 awful theme tune. I, I've even. I've, I think I've seen someone on Twitter say it was good. Someone in the media, and I felt like felt like just absolutely slandering them. It's, it's too long. Good. It's too soppy. It's bad anyway it's um, insipid. it is insipid it's insipid and it just it, it thinks too much of itself it hangs around too long also do you like you know i think it's the i think um i, I remember danny baker saying this like his son sonny made this comment about 
I think we all do this, like, you know, when the Champions League uh, theme song comes on. Oh, yeah. You're watching it, and everyone goes, everyone sings along, the Champions, the Champions League. <laughs> <laughs> the Champions League. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody does that. Yeah. So, yeah, in, the, in the funny thing with this is I actually think, um, in my head, I weirdly, at the end of it, I end, I, I, I weirdly, when the, the words come on the screen, I go, Sunland till I die. <laughs> Does anybody else do this? Please tell me. I don't. Well, see, I, I, kind I was of, always I just annoyed try and, if I, if I seg, let it go. Past, it to the sorry, go on. I try and segue it in the times that I let it okay. play. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was just always so annoyed that I'd missed the skip intro um, moment from uh, from Netflix. Um but there's so many good bands from the northeast, and in particular, sort of Sunderland and around Sunderland. You know, as you mentioned, the Future Heads. It could have been the Future Heads. It could have been, you know, if you want a folk song, the Unthanks are a brilliant band from the northeast. I'm sure one, they've got a tune that would have done the job already, or two, they would have been able to write something suitable for it. Uh, it just doesn't. Why don't they have? Why doesn't the guy have a Geordie accent or a Mackham accent? If we you know, if we're being ultra locally precise, do you know what I mean? It's just. I don't think it's. it's uh, yeah, I don't that's, think. That's well, really, I, well, I don't think that ever really sells. So that's another argument, but yeah. I don't know what that sells. That thing, but uh, anyway, anyway. So yeah, we both we're agreed. We hate the theme tune. I did. I did. Uh, I've watched two uh, documentaries on Netflix this week, Luke. Uh, the other one is the one that everybody's watching, Tiger, Tiger King. Tiger King. Yeah, I've and, been watching. I've watched the two episodes, two episodes of that as well. Excellent. Um, you haven't met the character I'm referring to in this yet, but um, when you do, I hope it will make you laugh. Uh, a lot but uh, two documentaries where a limping businessman seems to take advantage of a company in dire straits um so <laughs> uh, it's uh yeah th- there's some there's some comparisons between the two definitely uh, <laughs> maybe they could have um isn't uh lauren laverne sunderland's darling oh yes maybe they could have um uh, Don't Falter featuring Lauren Laverne. Do you remember that? Do you remember that one? I'm not sure. I do. Mint Royale. Mint Royale with Lauren oh, Laverne. Okay. Don't Falter. Or you could have some Kaniki, ki- whatever you yeah. pronounce it. Kaniki. Chuck some Kaniki in there. That would have been good. This is it. I, like I said, you could have some future heads playing when they come out. And that's it. Everyone goes fucking bananas for it. Everyone's like, they're from Sunderland, you know? No, oh, that'd be it. The fans yeah. would love it. The fans yeah. would be like, this is upbeat. It's a rock song. You know, it's by this band, you know, indie rock does kind of play to the large kind of audience. The, the problem is, Charlie Meth then has <sighs> never been excited by a piece of music in his life. You know, he's the sort of person that doesn't really, no, you know, listen to some chill out stuff, but I uh, don't really, <laughs> really, I really got into, um, I really got into like bands, you know? You can just. <laughs> <laughs> that's the person that's choosing. He's not, you know, it's about as far away from man of the people as you can get. I know, I know. I've yeah, got a, yeah, got a, club, got a, I've got a, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a flute with Mac best of. It's quite good. <laughs> we might listen to that Sunday morning, you know. <laughs> change the, change the old espresso for a macchiato and uh, stretch, stretch the legs a little bit. <laughs> Go back up, up north, as they say. Well, you know, sometimes you've got it, you know. <laughs> my, oh. friends just like, my friends are just like, you know, isn't that a filthy hovel filled with awful people? And I'm like, actually, um, not quite as bad as you'd think. So, um, shown them, I've shown them. <laughs> actually, uh, some of them wash. Some, uh, yeah. I met a few of them actually have uh, encountered soap. <laughs> I actually donated uh, 10,000 bars of soap to the <laughs> local... <laughs> That's an awful, awful person. God, what oh, a piece terrible. of shit. Terrible. What a piece of shit. So, as an assessment of the show, though, would you say it's worth watching for people? It's definitely worth watching. I don't know. Like, it's... Like, I guess the... I think the thing we're going to talk about afterwards, let's... I'll just put this on our agenda, Rich, to add to the the whopping episode we're doing so far. Um, <laughs> but um, I think the thing we should talk about is would... How do you feel... How would you feel if this was Wednesday? Um, so we can kind of put that just to the thing. Um, well, that, like I think a that's lot of this... It's, it's so interesting because, you know, in my thought pie chart and my emotional reaction to this, 
a lot of it's like i understand i get these people i get what this is another part yeah. of it's like like you like you know there's those guys having banter with the you know the gcses and the yes, talking yes. about luco 9 some of it just embarrasses the shit out of me <laughs> some of it makes me so red it makes me blush so hard <laughs> like some of this stuff and um, and some of it's just like i get what they're trying to do it just doesn't work and i don't like it yeah but, but outside of that i don't know what you would do like i you need to you need to focus on the fans crying and being upset afterwards you know you need to focus on you know Stuart donald going in the away end and going ballistic with the fans yeah. you know you need to focus on all those things because it's it it tells a story and it tells what this is um you know, even to some of the uh, some of the weird stuff, like kids dribbling footballs on on that pier on that, that like by the lighthouse. <laughs> yeah, that was a great like thing they used. Like the I don't know, is that a big Sunderland landmark? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but it's 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 funny. Um, you know, it's. So do you want to switch to the, to talking about whether we'd like it? So so I, th- I, I think um, both well, actually, sorry, human, I it's worth watching. I apologize. I'm actually sorry. A few more things. Okay. I had, le- no, I had I less funny comments near the end of it because I actually got absorbed into it. So that's a positive. Um, yeah. I will say it's the only show I think ever been broadcast that mixes tense music and the sounds of seagulls coring. <laughs> that's a big thing. Um, what else can I say about this show? Uh, dramatic music intensified and seagulls coring. Um, did you think the... So this is a really interesting thing. That Easter angle got a bit weird and a bit creepy in the last episode. It was a bit midsummery. Oh, I didn't... I I wrote down, what is that vicar doing? That Yeah, that sort of... So they, there's a scene where they, they go up... Uh, that's actually while they're still in the promo- the automatic promotion hunt, isn't it? That Easter scene. Yeah. So they have they have this but that so that well i suppose talking about the music the northeast is that's you know some of the oldest sort of established establishments in the whole of the uk are, are in the northeast you know it's like it's very there's tons of castles up in northumberland and, and that sort of area right. so so there's a lot of traditions and and a lot of the uk's um you know historic and religious traditions are, are pretty sort of pagan and creepy. sure yes so this one I is know. Yeah. this one is walking a cross up to the top of the hill um, and having a man not um not nailed to it but he's underneath sort of prostrating in in a um with his shirt off um they they found a a, a slightly swarthy looking gentleman in Sunderland they found a, <laughs> a slightly off white chap um, to represent Jesus <laughs> Oh and got word. him in a towel at the oh bottom of this road. Oh my word! <laughs> it's very. I want to say it's very. It's very Wicker Man. Mm, it is, but then so he's doing his sermon, but he's also mixing in stuff about the club. So it's like it's you know, you know Jesus <sighs> deliver us from evil, and also make sure the club win. <laughs> yeah. It's, he also on the day of the playoff final, he he um, prints his pre- his league his uh, promotion prayer in the newspaper. Yes, I remember um, that. Yeah, each How could like deliver us from League One instead of deliver. Uh, 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 I just I don't know. I didn't like. For thine all. is the sunlight, Max Power and the glory, <laughs> are ever and ever. Niall Quinn. <laughs> Kill McGeady's foot, bringeth down your power, and bring it all the way through McGeady. <laughs> Let Chris Maguire put in a cross. Forgive <laughs> us our Louvens. Forgive us our Louven, as as we forgive those who have Louvens against us. <laughs> <laughs> That's the episode I did, title, I did Rich. love uh, me. <laughs> I did love, sorry, by the way, the first bit of football that we see, like immediately the season kicks off and um, Glenn Leuvens goes yes. to sleep. Yes. Let's a man run in behind him and Chris Maguire hoofs him down in the box to give away a penalty. It's literally the first bit of football that we see. A uh, little combination of those two two ex-Wednesday players. <laughs> Um, yeah, the the vicar was it was so strange. That sermon on the hill was so so weird. <laughs> and you know, presumably there are people in Sunderland that one don't like football at all, and two support other football teams. How would you feel? Are you left out? Is your religiosity not working for you that day? 
guess it's weird for us because, uh, you know, as Wednesdayites, we, you know, I mean, maybe less so for yourself, Rich. Apologies yeah. for kind of casting you aside here. <laughs> you know, I'm from Sheffield, so I grew up in a city which was, you know, two clubs. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then and then the filtration of you know people sporting other teams, as you said, but not having that kind of <clears throat> that town. This is the club mentality. Yes, is it, it? It feels a little bit strange to me. Like that, I, it's something I can't quite fully relate to. I'll be honest. I know, I know. It is it's a it's a weird thing to see, definitely. Um, <clears throat> so, are you happy to sort of move on to a bit of a discussion of what a Wednesday version? might be like whether it's something we'd want to see or not yes yes please <laughs> so i i would i i think i would i would really like to see a wednesday version i'm sure the cringing moments would make me cringe all the more do you uh, um do you think that the the um the ending would have foreboding pulsating ominous musics <laughs> that suggests it's a horror film and that they will be sundered until they till they die whenever that fantasy purgatory ends <laughs> It'll be Wednesday, Wednesday till well, it'll be Wednesday till I die. Yeah, and it'll basically just say that we're all just trapped in this endless loop of um, <laughs> of just bad karma. Basically, <laughs> we just keep coming back as just uh, like a fly or something or something really bad. Okay. Maybe. Oh, we do that thing that you told me about. We were telling me about that short story where the guy come, comes back as a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but he, he he doesn't he doesn't get to like live as a human being a horse. That's the thing he can't appreciate it fully. Is that what you say? <laughs> I remember this is a this is a uh, a series of um, short stories about kind of different afterlifes, potential afterlifes called some, and uh, <laughs> it really uh, got to Luke on an existential level, and he uh, <laughs> he wanted to rename the book Bomb uh, as in being sort of bombed out. <laughs> It really gave an odd, an odd uh, feeling to the night out when we were when we were t- when we were talking about it at the beginning of it. Um, <laughs> it's on Audible, read by Stephen Fry. If you're interested. Mm. Um, so, but you 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 sort of expressed a bit more doubt at whether you would like to see a Wednesday version. I do because it's. I don't think you're getting someone in to kind of cover the club. They've got the final say, I imagine. I don't think it would ever happen because I don't think Chancery would let it happen. I don't no. think a lot of the people at the club would come off very well. Um, I suppose you're right. I mean, in terms of how you know how people get perceived, how people come across. I just, I think I just like some of that behind the scenes. Maybe I just want a couple of YouTube videos where the kit man tells us about his favorite day at Wednesday or so. I don't know. I just, I like those are the bits that are interesting to me is seeing some of those characters around the club. And we talked about our day that we had at the training ground and, you know, we were able to sit, we had a, a slice of pizza before the players came in for their, their sort of meal after training. And I, I, you know, what's, what's that lady like? Does she have a sort of fun relationship with the, uh, the players, Do you know, a bit of, bit of bants, with certain players <clears throat> those sort of things i just think would be interesting and nice it just a bit more I, th- I suppose you always want to know more about your football club it's another thing we've touched on this yeah that, that's where the sort of interest to me comes that sort of a, a, a glimpse behind the curtains kind of thing mm-hmm. and i know that there'd be certain characters that we'd have at the club that would come off quite well you know i mean hey we've we've met a few of them or met a few of them in previous regimes you know yeah we on that training day lindy i think her name at the time was lindy taylor i think she yes, changed her name yeah. now she took us around she was great the she club was secretary, lindy taylor um yeah a bit of a bit of a jewel and a diamond and someone very much who that mentality of someone who's behind the scenes keeping keeping as much together as possible being you know a kind of glue to everything that kind of happens and goes on um i think, yeah. we, met, I think we met some of the kit men at the time i think we met we met Paul Smith, who's no longer with the club, unfortunately. Yeah. Very likable, very likable chap, and a Wednesday night to boot as well. The, the ice bath uh, equivalent at the club at the time was uh, wheelie bins filled with ice water. Yeah. Oh, that was our equivalent of the cryo chamber. <laughs> very much so, very much so. <laughs> but that's a rare... Most people will not have anything like that opportunity that we had. No, uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly so fortunate sort of that we... It. That we had that on top of another <laughs> occasion as well, but that'll be a story for another time. Um, are you, are you, but I, I do like that you've 
in that I think what you've kind of done is ter- internalized that <laughs> GCSE question and and a- applied it to you <laughs> making your comment to Clinton Morrison and see I'd love to see a documentary <laughs> documentary where a, a man in his uh, his early 20s <laughs> gets excited about Clinton Morrison banging him in to his face that would have been a, that would be a treat for me I'd love to see that I would come off exactly like a lot of these fans who I think I've ridiculed on the show and maybe behind closed doors and maybe in text messages or comments to people. Um, I would come across as someone that you guys would think is a complete and utter embarrassment. Because we were, we were in our late 20s. We were about, I was about 26, 27 at the time. So it's what, about eight, nine years ago. And I remember saying to my work colleague Paul what I said, and he was embarrassed for me. <laughs> and um most embarrassing we were like, well, that's the thing is like but again it's it's that whole mentality of like it it's that weird mentality of you can at what point do we stop kind of idolizing football players as human beings and at what age did it's like it, it's kind of seen like i think that was something i'd be a lot more accepted if we were children <laughs> yeah well i think maybe most embarrassingly luke just to share some of the shame <laughs> <laughs> until until very very late in the day i thought we were actually going to be taking part in training i'm sorry i because i said it was a training day and it was <laughs> yeah but you know as soon as you said that it wasn't i was like oh that makes a lot more sense <laughs> because the ludicrous <laughs> idea of us two lumbering around with the players what if you'd broken clinton morrison he wouldn't have been able to bang anything in in league one I know, he might have only got like half the number of goals. He might have only got two as opposed to five. <laughs> the mighty five that he weighed in with. <sighs> he would barely yeah, be able to windmill his arms. I know, my argument about Clinton Morrison is, I think, after that season, I think he maybe scored something like three or four goals one season in League One. Yeah. And my argument is, if I'd played enough minutes as Clinton Morrison, in, it, in that position, I could score the same amount of goals. I reckon so. Because so much of it, I wonder how much is... As an experiment, I wonder how much it would it'd be to just see if you just played someone, a random, person. a random person, and how they would compare in that situation. Because, I mean, so much of it, I think, is purely just being in the right position at the right time. If you're a Clinton Morrison type at a certain level of football. I think that quite often with players who sort of go off like a rocket in their career and then end up somewhere quite dismal. So, like, look at Richie Humphreys. He scored, I think he scored four goals in four games in the Premier League. And then never really did anything very much. For, and uh, He had a fine football career. He played football all of his, you know, he played a full career as a professional footballer, which on many levels is winning the lottery. But it's like, what if he'd scored, what if he'd scored 10 goals before like January and some other team picked him up? And I, I also, we talked about Medin. You know, I I genuinely think if a, if a big club had taken a chance on him in the season where he was like playing with all that, pomp and ceremony and he'd got a good start he could have had a a completely different life to what he ended up in and it's not that he's any different really as a player it's just so little is actually your you and your control like there's a lot of luck involved there's plenty of really really good footballers who never get anywhere near making it and there's plenty of average footballers who make a wonderful career for themselves. Mm. Some of that will be application. Some of it will be mentality. But a huge part is just being in the right place on the right day or the right things falling into place. Um, and as you touched on, you know, that um, the importance of Madja to those other players, that, that could be... So every one of their their lives changes with, the, with that sliding doors moment of Madja leaving. Because potentially, they could have been championship players uh, last year or this year. They could have been, you know, could have been Premier League players the year next. You know, all these things are possibilities. Uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of fascinating. But definitely, I think you would have at least bagged as many as Clinton Morrison if you'd been playing up front for us that season. <laughs> I think he so. basically I couldn't really move. So. It's just about the same as me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, I'd co- and I'd cost a lot less as well. There you go. Save money. Well, that first season you would. Once you got your sixth goal, go right up yourself. Get, get Stuart Donald on the phone. <laughs> I, I also like uh, Josh Marger being the John Hanna of Sunderland Football Club. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we've, um, we've done a lot of talking, Luke. We have. So all that's left for... This episode is for me to say, you know, wish you a good week, Luke, and wish all of the people listening a good week, and 
and say cheerio. Have a good one, everyone. See ya. Bye. Baz Bannon, Kiribati, not as good a pairing as they seem to be. <laughs> Love it, love it, love it.